Private lending can be a great source of passive income and an alternative source of cash flow for those investors who don't necessarily want to deal with rental properties and tenants. The challenge for most investors getting into private lending is that they don't know where to start. How much money do you need? How do you secure your funds to mitigate risk? And what options do you have if someone doesn't pay you back? To help answer all of those questions and more, I sat down with Anna Scott to discuss her experience as a private lender and real estate investor. Stick around until the end of the video where Anna shares the kinds of returns that you can expect in today's market. It might surprise you. Hey, what's up? Darren Voros here. My mission is to help you reduce your real estate investing education time from months to minutes. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. And now enjoy the interview. So, I mean, private lending is all about individuals lending to another individual and mm. you can actually lend to a corporation as well, but it's, you know, an individual access the bank to finance that project that they're looking to do. And typically private lending is of short term duration of less than a year. There are really two types of private loans. So there are secured and unsecured. Can you explain the difference between the two? So secured lending is uh, it's secured against property, it's secured against real estate. The security is the subject property, the building. It is a mortgage on the property. And uh, so the mortgage can be funded through cash, through you know funds you gather through your HELOC, could be through an RSP or TFSA or, or any other registered product like a, a Lira, a, a LIF. To, to register or to create a mortgage on the property, you work with you know good real estate investing lawyer. So our secured option is a mortgage. Uh, our unsecured option is a promissory note. Can you explain what a promissory note is? A promissory note is basically a glorified IOU. It is a mm. promise to pay by the borrower to you. It is more so about relationship. It's more about trust. You're extending, loaning them money based on all the information they provided you with up front. In both scenarios, it's our job to vet our private deals. So how do you go about vetting your private lending opportunities? So I actually just did a P-note, $100,000 lend on a 16-unit building. And this now was a repeat loan to a couple that uh, I've previously lent to. But uh, I had an initial conversation with all the principals in the deal because it was also a joint venture and with another party. And I, I said, okay, first and foremost, tell me about you. What have you done? Have you done this before? I want to see your track record. I want to see past projects, the quality. I want to talk to other investors that have also lent them money. And then I'll have them tell me a little bit more about the opportunity. Where is it? What city? Why did you choose that city? What's around that building? And then I'll go into the pro forma, the nitty gritty, the numbers and say, okay, show me the project plan. How are you servicing the debt? How are you allocating? What's your budget? What are you going to do first? What are you going to do next? And then looking at the deal, then I look at the property, how much equity, what are they buying it for? What's the appraised value for? And I kind of like throw it at them fairly quickly and how the confidence and the, the quickness of the response that tells me a lot about the knowledge they have. Like you got to know your property inside and out. You got to be passionate about this property. You got to convince me that this is a great deal, Anna, that I want you to get in on as well. And then I look at them personally. Okay, what other projects have you got in the go? What's your overall exposure? What's your loan to value? Because a private lender is all about the equity in the deal. And how can I recover my costs? I look at the exit strategy. Okay, tell me not one, not two, maybe three different exit strategies. How are you going to get out of this to be able to pay me back and other investors that are in the project? And I want to know who are the other investors, right? After you've gone through your due diligence and vetted your potential borrower, what is the process then before you actually hand over those funds to feel secure in doing so? Because most people will tell you that capital preservation is a much bigger motivator than potentially earning high returns. If you do this properly and you work with, you know, a good real estate lawyer, it's all about what you do up front. It should never actually come to a point where a default occurs. But hey, you know, shit could happen and uh, circumstances may be beyond their control. But there is due diligence legally that you need to or should do beforehand. You want to see if there's any judgments or maybe they're in bankruptcy or have filed for bankruptcy before. Maybe there's some collections outstanding on them. So you need to do your due diligence on them personally. Do you have different ways of securing against a promissory note versus something that has more security built into it? A promissory note is, can be a very short document, very high level. Here's the, the particulars of the deal, how much I'm lending to you. Here's the start, here's the end, here's the interest rate, all that kind of stuff. But I have a four document package that I used when I, when I do P notes. So a loan agreement, so the loan agreement talks more about the, the nature of the loan, the, how the interest is calculated. I have something called a general securities agreement. 
So within the GSA, I've got the loan agreement and the PINO. And the GSA is essentially, it states I can go against any and all assets that you hold, not just the subject property on which the loan is being made. Because t- people typically don't default on their primary residences. It's if there is going to be any kind of lending, they may have an issue with paying the loan back on that property. And I asked them to sign off on that. Then I also have a, an assignment of rents provision uh, schedule that I added that to say, if it's like a multifamily, in the event that there is any kind of issue, I can go against and redirect the rents payable on this to help recover the amount of money that I've lent to you. With the right clauses, right provisions in your document package that you give to the borrower, have all these conversations, do all the due diligence up front, work with your lawyer to do all those checking. You have more confidence and more reassurance that this deal, you are protected to an extent that you can go take civil action if you had to, you would sue for your funds back. Whereas on a secured mortgage, like a a security against property, you have the same rights and privileges as a bank. So if in the event of default, you would have to go through the power of sale process in Ontario, like a foreclosure, but you can recover your investment because it is registered and there are more legal protections for secured mortgages as opposed to unsecured private notes, right? When you do private mortgages, you need to make sure the appraisal is issued in your name, issued to you by the appraisal company. There's title insurance and that you're the benefit payee, title and fire insurance as well. So in the event of a claim, you are the one that will get the proceeds first. And how do you track the progress on the deals that you lend on? It's important to be on top of your borrowers. You can't just lend them the money, walk away and hope for the best. With private lending, I want regular communications. I want them to give me an update. I want to make sure that my money is being worked on on this project and this property. Mm. So every project that I lend on, I have a great relationship with the lender. I have conversations with them. We have Zoom meetings. Because one of the other risks with with P-notes, there is statute in Ontario uh, called the Limitations Act. Let's say you've initiated, you've sent out a demand letter for a default position saying, I, you would work with your lawyer, send out a demand loan if, if they hadn't paid within 14 to 30 days um, and had not contacted you or had not. But usually within 30 to 46, 45 days, if I haven't heard from them or anything, I am well within my right to initiate legal proceedings. So the Limitations Act states that if within two years of the outstanding amount having not been paid, the loan actually, you have no recourse after that. You cannot go after your funds. The opportunity to recover your investment has been has been lost. That interview was packed with so much great information. And the thing that I love about private lending is that this can be done without having to dedicate a lot of your time. So for those of you who have limited time, but want to be investing in real estate, this is a great alternative for you. And as you can see, you don't have to sacrifice your returns as well. And this is a myth that many investors have around private lending. They think that with less time dedication, you'll see low returns and this is not always the case. To get more in-depth knowledge of how this all works, it's one of the modules I cover in my course for investors who don't have a lot of time to dedicate. I'll leave a link in the description below for this specific course. For all of my courses and content, you can check out my website at darrenboros.com for more information. If you're unsure of which strategies that you should be focusing on, take the 30 second assessment below, which will tell you which strategies that you should be using as a real estate investor. As always, if you have questions for me, you can leave those in the comments section below. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I post regularly. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.